Tonight's topic is, uh, we'll discuss what a chassid needs to know with regards to food service establishments, which includes restaurants, caterers, prepared foods, such as butcher shops, and the entire nekudis that are, are relevant to us as chassidim. Bezer Hashem, I hope to cover whatever I can in that regard. Um, I will leave time for questions at the end. I just ask in order to keep the flow, to keep the questions at the end. I also want to say that I will not be making any public statements about Echsherim. The purpose of tonight's presentation this year is just to increase our awareness and our knowledge about the food industry. And this will empower us to make appropriate decisions based on what we are looking for. To start with, there's many letters from the Rebbe, that the Rebbe brings out that kosher food and drink in a mohodidika way, in a high standard, is it refines us as people. It has a, we know from, from many places in Torah, it's brought down in Tanya also, that it goes into our it becomes our flesh and blood. So it has a very profound effect on us. So the mission and the notion of being careful about what we consume is a very noble and a very important task. As Hasidim, we know Vinaflino, we're looking for the higher standard. We're not looking for, for the lowest quality. And on the market, there are different standards of what's available. So just like when it comes to physical possessions, before we buy something, we do a certain amount of research we want to check the ratings, check the consumer reports, con you know, hear from what people have to say about the product, and much more so when it comes to our spiritual pursuits, purchasing food, we should have a basic awareness of what we are doing and where we are going. <clears throat> Another thing that's important to keep in mind is the perspective of the Heksha, where they're coming from. There are some hechshedim that are catering to a local crowd, like for example, an out-of-town local vad can have standards that are appropriate for that particular community. Doesn't mean those standards are appropriate for us as chassidim. You can have a chassidish hechsha that's gearing their products to the chassidish market, and they're gonna be more careful about certain things. And then you have national hechshedim, which are, are trying to bring kosher food and are bringing kosher food to the world at large. And at, in, in that, type of pursuit with that given goal in mind, there are certain times when certain chumras and hidurim they cannot necessarily do. So just case in point, all national achshedim certify products that are not chol of Yisrael and not pas Yisrael. So as a consumer, you have a basic obligation to know that. So if you see a product, the hechsher is reliable, they're reliable for what they're certifying, they can be trusted for what they're saying, but they're not making claims that the product is chol of Yisrael or pas Yisrael. You as a consumer have to be aware of that. We have the luxury, given that we're based in the tri-state area, there are a number, hundreds of food service establishments. Just to be clear, the word food service establishments is a shame kloli, is a general term that refers to any type of establishment that serves prepared food, not in a package, basically. It's open food, could be a restaurant, a caterer, a butcher shop, a takeout place, a deli, right? All, the whole thing. So we live in the in tri state area, and there are a number of such places available with Echsherim. Many of them, probably more than 50% of these establishments, happen to be owned by a Shemer Shabbos. By a from a yid. So we have the advantage of being able to be a little choosy, being a little, a little discerning. I want to go to a restaurant or a food service establishment that's owned by a from a yid. There's no question about it that if you have a good hashkacha and you have a mashkiach and you have a from balabas, it's well set up. The fact that the owner is from only makes it better as a plus. All national echshedim, even some chassidish echshedim, certify establishments that are owned by non from Yidin or lahavdal, even owned by goyim. Of course, in such cases, they have very strict measures in place. The owners have no access to the kitchen. But the reality is that if you can go to a place where the owners are from a Yid, 
and it has a good hashkacha, it's an extra bonus. So if we live out in a place where we have very little choices, I wouldn't necessarily make that suggestion. But over here, we have lots of choices. It's, it's, it's kedai, it's proper if one can do that, if one has that availability. Now we're going to go into some details of what to look for, and what type of questions to ask. We'll start by speaking about people making their own simchas. There was a story that happened actually in Crown Heights a few weeks ago. Somebody made a simcha and they bought the food from a reliable, reliably certified caterer. But the actual event itself was not certified. It was what they call a drop-off job. The shkacha or the caterer dropped off the food and the party plan or whatever it was, was taking care of the event. I don't think there was any cooking happening at this particular event. But the party planner or somebody made a mistake and they actually served chal of akum milk in Crown Heights. Baruch Hashem, one of the guests, spotted it, I think, right away. I don't know if anybody was nichshal. I hope not. But the point I'm trying to say is that if you don't have any oversight on a particular function, things can go wrong. Doesn't necessarily mean that every drop of job has to have a mashkiach, but at least there should be someone, a cautious professional that someone can consult with to review things, some sort of sense of balabatishkeit in a ruchnistic sense, a sense of taking ownership of what's actually taking place. When it comes to larger functions, for sure you need to have a mashkiach in place. Another thing I want to point out is with regards to mashkas and the like, there's one shul in Crown Heights who I want, I want to say has a beautiful hither. They only allow mashka to be served that, that has a heksher. Full disclosure, all the heksherim allow in their restaurants certain types of mashkas that don't have a heksher because they, they know that they're kosher. Some could be not kosher, depending on which country they have inside information. But Leisman de Pollock, nobody's going to argue the fact that if you're going to get one that's certified, it's even better. So just be aware that when you're going to a kosher certified restaurant with most echshedim, they're going to allow liquor to be served that's not certified kosher. It's approved as kosher because they know based on the industry of what you can accept, what you can't accept. It doesn't equal the same level as actually certified kosher. So if you want to be more mahudar, there's room to be more mahudar in that, in that regard. Another example with regards to caterers is many times caterers use garnish. They'll use kale as a garnish. Kale is a very highly bug sensitive vegetable. It's very healthy also, but it's, it's very hard to clean. So if it's being used as a garnish, let's say to decorate a platter of, lo of locks or the like, it's not acceptable just to take kale straight out of the fresh kale or even one that's not properly checked and cleaned and use it as a garnish on food because the bugs can easily make their way onto the food. Some caterers, what they do in that case is they'll put saran wrap over the garnish. Doesn't look as pretty, but it takes care of the bug issue. Or some will actually properly make sure that it gets cleaned like you would do if you're gonna eat it. Just giving you an example of something that people that are not in the industry may not be mindful of, may not even realize, but it's something you have to be careful about. Another thing I want to discuss is catered events in outside hotels. Some hotels have a kosher kitchen that's dedicated kosher all the time. That's wonderful. That's a mahodadika thing. There's actually a place like that in Connecticut. That's wonderful. But a lot of times catered events involve koshering the kitchen. Koshering the kitchen itself is a very complicated thing. Most commercial kitchens will not allow you to bring a torch inside. So the way the ovens are koshered is... They'll take the racks out, the mahudadik away, even though it's not so mahudar, is they'll take the racks out, put them on top of the stove top, and burn them with live fire. But the actual stove itself, the oven, excuse me, the oven itself, they'll just put some kind of a dovra pegim and then turn it on to let's say 500 or 550 degrees for a couple of hours. It's not a real even gummer. And the rationale is that the food's not actually touching the walls of the oven, but the racks where it does touch, they're giving it a even gummer. Okay. There's such a mahalach, but it's not so mahodr. I'll tell you a story that happened to me about 20 years ago. In Kashras, 
there's a, there's a mashkichim, there's the Rav HaMachshe, the mashkichim, and then God's the active partner, because he needs siyata deshmaya and everything that we do. So it's a known thing that mashkichim are taught to pace the floor. You're supervising a kitchen, you're watching the food being prepared, but you also have to make sure that where they're serving the food, you know, you have to, you have to basically be around. So I was, I was the head mashkich of an event that served, that served about 3,000 meals in the course of three days, about 1,000 meals a day, 350 guests per meal. And it was the end of the program, it was a Sunday evening, and it was a fleshika meal, and I was doing my thing. I was in the kitchen. I was going, doing the rounds, checking the hallways, checking the actual ballroom. There was no tray for event happening at the same time. So in that sense, it was easier. And it was dessert time. And I see that the, one of the waiters is wheeling a cart of Haagen-Dazs Cholavakum ice cream, single serves, not in our kitchen, not from our refrigerator, from a different part of the hotel. So I was like, whoa. I said, I said buddy, where are you going with this? He says, we're serving it for dessert. I said, you're not serving that for dessert. First of all, it was a fleishig meal. The guests happened to be, they weren't even from the people, but they, they wanted a glad kosher event. And we would not allow non of Yisrael to be served anyways, even if it would be a, a parv or a milchig meal. And I told that to him. What happened? The guests who were not from, they bought a bunch of ice cream single serves, and they had a few hundred left over, and they told the, the wait staff without telling me. They said, oh, we'll have it tomorrow night for dessert. They didn't mean any bad because they didn't know better. But I'm just showing you the value, the importance of having that sense of presence. When we do that, of course, today we should make sure that we go in the right place and we're going to see what we need to see. A reliable hashkacha, people often ask me, you know, what makes a hashkacha reliable? A reliable hashkacha will not allow something, a foreseeable problem to exist. So an example of a, of a foreseeable problem would be to certify a restaurant who the owner has the exact same type of restaurant, Treif, in, in close proximity where they could be, who knows, exchanging food or whatnot. You know, it's too close for comfort. So you have to also be mindful of what's happening outside the restaurant you're certifying. So one of the questions we ask is, does, does this owner have other restaurants? Are they the same type of food? If they're not the same type of food, it's of, it's of course better. But you have to be mindful of this. If you're ordering online, which a lot of people do today, what they call Uber Eats or all these other fancy types of ways of getting our food delivered, you also have to be mindful because some restaurants that have chain names, only a few of those establishments or that locations are kosher certified. And if you call the wrong one with the same or similar sounding name, you can get tray food delivered. Now, hopefully you'd realize that because the food's not going to come sealed. But it already happened with people were nichshal, they stumbled because they weren't mindful. So if you're ordering or when you're ordering, be very careful to make sure you're ordering from the place you intend on ordering from. And of course, be, be, be mindful that it's going to come properly sealed and certified. When it comes to the culture of a restaurant, it's something that Hachshedim are sensitive to, to some degree, not necessarily to the degree that you're going to like, so when it comes to a restaurant in a Fruma neighborhood, it's pretty much accepted that we have to be even more sensitive to the culture because we have an existing standard of Yiddishkeit in place and we don't want to lower that standard. When it comes to restaurants that are kosher certified in locations that don't really have an established from community, so then a lot of Echshedim, without going into particular names, some of them take an approach, well, we're bringing, it, bringing kosher food to an area that didn't have kosher food, it's an, it's an aliyah, it's, 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 a, it's a step up, which, which is truth to that. But there are certain things that, that reliable hachshirim will not allow. They do require a basic standard of tzniyas from the weight staff. Doesn't mean that they're gonna to have to be um, to the full degree of what, it, what we expect from Abbas Yisrael, but there shouldn't be open pizzas in a restaurant. We also don't allow women singing. I'm also mindful about live singing, certainly during times when we're not allowed to hear live music or things of that nature. When it comes to local vadim, some of the challenges that we have is some yidin, particularly the ones that are not, not Hasidim, they look at Chol of Yisrael as a chumrah, as, an, as, a, as a, you know, a, nice, a nice stringency. It's an added bonus. It's not a requirement in halacha. Of course, we as Hasidim, 
we view Chol of Yisrael as a chiyuf, as a must, as halacha mamish. So as a result of this difference in how things are viewed, some local vadim will certify a dairy establishment, could be a restaurant, caterer, pick your choice, that carries both Chol of Yisrael and non Chol of Yisrael products simultaneously, baked in the same oven, they're all for bringing together in the same oven. You can have you can have chol v'yisrael pizza with not chol v'yisrael knishes. All because they look at the blia, the absorption. It's all it's all heter because it's just a chumrah. There's a different view on it. It's not because they're trying to chas for shol and be dishonest. No, according to the way they their mesoida, that's how they learn. In fact, Rav Hankin held was a famous pesik for the litzvah he, he held that there's, there's no no isra blia. By by Chol of Akum, known as Chol of Stam, based on Ramesh's Shuva. So let some Litzvah Shayyidin do go with that kind of Psak that Mahalach. Of course, we as Chassidim do not. So just be mindful if you're going to a, a restaurant that's from the local Vad, it's very possible if it's a Milchik restaurant, they're going to be having Milchik that's Chol Vizrael, Nam Chol Vizrael, which is, of course, a problem for us. And you may just be better off going to a Fleishiger restaurant. And if you don't like the Fleish that they're serving, you could have a fish dish, but at least you don't have to worry about this issue of the Chol Vizrael, Nam Chol Vizrael, because it's a Fleishiger restaurant. Another thing to be mindful of when you go to a restaurant is that not every item that you think is parv is parv. We know that Americans, you know, La Paz Adam, it says in Shulchan Aruch, but I would say in America, people live on French fries, the fast food world. So fr uh, French fries in Milchiger restaurants are often fried in the same oil that they use to fry cheese sticks. And then in the Fleischiger restaurants, the same oil that are used to fry chicken nuggets. So it's a tafshul and a spashul, the tafshul shabasa really, or cholov. So Really, we're no yig to, to be machmer and to keep it that status. It's not really parv. That you can speak, you can ask a rav, but it's it's not it's not really parv. Certainly, you you, you know you, you can't consider it like a parv food. Um, most hechshedim don't allow non mavushal wine to be served in restaurants. We did have a story many years ago. We certified a very fancy restaurant, and the rav allowed us to serve non mavushal wine with very strong stipulations and policies in place. We had a special mashkiach who was just handling the wine. We didn't allow any customers to hold the bottle. We poured into their cups only. Okay, I'm not saying it's awesome. I'm saying it's complicated. And but they're chlal, you're not gonna find that in restaurants unless they're gonna pay a lot of money, have a separate mashkiach who's going to control that. When it comes to restaurants, also pay very pay close attention to the menu. I, I saw a menu of a, of a particular heksher, a chsidish heksher, which is known to be uh, average to below average. Of course, no names will be, will be mentioned. And they were serving artichoke hearts in the salad. So artichoke hearts are very difficult or impossible to clean unless you actually peel it open because there's places for the bugs to hide in the heart. The bottoms are different. So you don't really have artichoke hearts that are certified reliably on the market. And mashkichim are not spending their time opening up an artichoke cart in a restaurant doing that, as far as I know. So I called up the, uh, I asked the, the manager, from manager, I said, how do, how do you have this? He says to me, no, it's not hearts, it's just bottoms. No, no, sorry, he told me that it's, it's hearts. He said they have one with hashkocha. I, I'm in the food industry, I never saw it with hashkocha, with a reliable hashkocha, there's one with not a reliable hashkocha. And then I called the Rav Amachshir and I asked him out of concern. And he says to me, it's bottoms. I said, well, I said to him, Maman you have a problem. If it's bottoms, then they're not telling the con consumers the, the truth because they're writing hearts. And your own manager told me it's hearts. And I said, I'd appreciate a clarification. That was a month ago. The Rav never called, never sent me back a message. So that's not acceptable. And if you see something, you have to say something. Another example of substandard Activity would be some shadim. Actually, have a podcast on this on this topic. It's one of my uh, pet peeves, if you will. Kashrus lists, so to speak. Um, when is it appropriate to rely on a list? When not? So the din is that if you're in a mass of dachuk, you're in a difficult situation. Has the same din as bidiyev. It's brought down a shulchan in many places. So in places where they don't have a kashrus system established, like you have in America or in Israel or in Canada. 
So there they do have to rely on lists, whether it's in England or in Australia or other countries, perhaps. They have to rely on lists because they have limited products available. So the local Rabonim checks certain products and they, they have a recommended list. A, a recommended product or a product that's on a list is not the same level as certified. Certified means there's a contract, there's more visits, there's more accountability, but it's something. So there they have to rely on lists because they're in a matz of dachuk, in a situation as bidiyev, and the Allah is that you're allowed to do something al um, khatkhila if you're in a matz of a bidiyev, because a bidiyev situation has a din of a khatkhila. But in America, where we have so much kosher certified food available to us, we're in a matz of a khatkhila, and we have no right to start relying on lists for things that are substandard, it could be problematic. And there are some cases where things are relied upon because they're a list. If it's a product that really needs hashkacha, meaning it's not something that's just is totally safe because there's nothing that can go wrong with it, then I don't believe it's appropriate in America or in Canada or in a place with established kashras to rely on lists. It's not the right usage of the, of the, of the principle, the concept. Some have and published lists of things that that don't need echshedim, or they were looked into, they do need echshedim, they were looked into. This kind of mahalach is, is not appropriate in a place where you have kosher food available to oneself. Okay, out-of-town restaurants, some of them, because, again, they, it's harder for them to find mashkichim, they'll certify restaurants, and I'm not chas I'm judging them, I'm just sharing information with you. I know this by Phoenicia, I know this firsthand. They'll certify restaurants without a frumiyat present. It's an acceptable standard amongst all reliable hachshedim that anytime you're serving open food and you're doing cooking, so well, let's say, for example, if it's a par bakery and they're just serving open food, then you can maybe have a mashkiach coming and going. It's a different story. But if you're actually doing any cooking, then you have Bishal Yisrael involved, or you have Bidikas Teiloim, you have to have a frumid present or a mashkiach, depending if the frumid is trained as a mashkiach, because there are kashras things happening. So some out-of-town vadim will certify a restaurant, they'll have a mashkiach coming in four times a day, how they control the fires. Sometimes they'll allow a non from you to turn on fires, which itself is a machlaikis. Um, and even if you are going to be makel and hold that a non from you can, uh, can, can turn on fires, especially you have another shayla, how do you know they really did it? Because if there's goyim around, they don't have nemanus. So it's, it's a complicated story. It's not a mahodidika situation. And it's something you have to look into. If you're in a situation where you have a question, reach out to a cautious professional for guidance. If you're requesting Lubavitch Street in a flesh sugar restaurant, you have to ask for it. A lot of restaurants, even if they're reliably certified, are not necessarily serving Lubavitch Chita. So if that's something that's important, you have to ask for it. When it comes to dairy restaurants, you also be mindful. Some of the fancier ones, if they're going to charge you $15 for a slice of pizza, I'm just joking, but a lot of money for pizza, you know, they'll put in some Parmesan, they'll make it a little gourmet. A lot of times it's going to be real Parmesan if they're charging you real money. Then it's it, real Parmesan is a six hour cheese. You get into the whole discussion, it's already been cooked again, it's been baked. You have the Yad Yehuda, who's Mekel, but I discussed this with Chabad Rabbanim, and we, we don't seem to rely on that heter. So we would be machmer to wait six hours after something that has Parmesan cheese in it. Be mindful of that. When going to a restaurant, also make sure that the Teuda, the, the kosher certificate, is up to date. Sometimes it's not, and then it really doesn't mean anything. So it could mean that the, the, the balabas is a batlin, but it could mean a lot of things, but it doesn't mean it's really certified. Bedikas Teiloim is a very important part of the mashkiach's task in a restaurant. It's not an exaggeration to say mashkiach will spend upwards of four hours plus just cleaning and checking vegetables. It's a very, very important task. Most restaurant owners do not want to buy pre-checked vegetables because they're four times the price and half the quality. So you're losing about 800% uh, there. So Mashkichim will do this cleaning. They have to get training, and all reliable echshedim have detailed instructions about how to clean vegetables. They're available online. They're okay, uh, veggie guys available online. Other echshedim have, have similar type of things. If you have a question, you always have a right to speak to the mashkiach. And if the mashkiach is not there, you have a problem. So, I mean, it could be outside but he should be around, so to speak, and available if need be. Just because you don't see the mashkiach does not mean it's a problem. Sometimes the mashkiach could be you know, downstairs in the kitchen. That's fine. But if you have a question, you should ask to speak to the mashkiach. If a, if a, if a restaurant lost its ashkacha because of a kashras violation, this does happen, 
then it's an accepted protocol amongst all reliable hechsheidim that no other heksha will pick it up and take the hashkacha without first finding out from the original heksha what went wrong and making tikkunim, fixing the problem. So let me give you an example. Let's say they found that the owner of this restaurant was dishonest. They brought in things they were not supposed to, they were warned, and et cetera. They, they were proof that you couldn't work with them. So if suddenly that owner sold the business to another new owner, so you have a clean slate, and you could certify it because there was a problem was an isagavra, so to speak. You had a problem with the person. But if you had a problem with something that's related to the restaurant itself, they actually have to fix that. Sometimes a problem can be remedied by putting in a mashkiach tamidi, not just relying on the firm owner. But the point is you have to address the kashra's problem. If it's ignored, then it's not acceptable. If, just, if they just didn't, that's a kashra's violation. Sometimes restaurants will switch echsherim for monetary reasons, which is fair game, and echsherim are honorable about it. They're not going to badmouth the hashkacha. If they left, they'll tell you, but there were no kashra's violations. And I've, I've been working in kashra's for a quarter of a century, I've never once come across a hechsher, a, re- a reliable, you know, large ashkacha that's going to pre- fake a kashras violation. Either there's a violation or not. So just be aware of that as well. There was a story that happened a few months ago, maybe even within the last year, let's put it that way. There was a, a bakery that was... Uh, Maybe it's good. It's good that it went out. No. It's clear. Hello. No, no, it's all right. yeah. Should I wait? <laughs> I was gonna say. <laughs> it's working. Good. Okay. Hello. No. I don't know. Hello. You hear me? Is it online? Is the landline working? Okay. So there was a... Uh, thank you. There was a, an establishment that uh, lost its hashkacha because the, uh, it was a Chol Vizrol establishment and the, the, the owner was, was caught bringing a non-Chol Vizrol and was, was warned many times by the hashkacha from Yid. And eventually the hashkacha took off the hechsha, which was the right thing to do. That same day, another, again, not reliable hashkacha, hashkacha that's very weak, let's put it that way. I wouldn't say it's worthless. They picked up the hashkacha right away and they didn't ask any questions. They didn't even call the mother hechsha, the original hechsha. And uh, that's an example of just, you know, that's not acceptable. So that's, a, that's a standard, it's just not acceptable. Sometimes you'll have hechsha that have policies, that have policies that are maybe a lower standard, but they could be upfront about it. That's okay. It depends who they're catering to. But if they're going to pick up things that the conscious problems and not, not even know what they are, not, not fix up problems, that, that, that really calls into question the whole reliability. How you know about this is a separate question, but I want to point out to you, that's an example of something that's not acceptable. So if someone says to you, this, this extra is not acceptable, they'll refer to things like that. Not that the standards lower. Some echsherim are, are, are totally honorable. They're totally reliable. What they're certifying may not be what I'm shopping for, right? If, I, if I'm looking for rain boots and they're selling sandals, it doesn't work what I'm looking for. doesn't mean the sandals are not good sandals. It's not what you're looking for. With regards to potato chips, another one of those foods that America lives on, um, As far as I know, all national echsherim will allow non bishri so potato chips to be served in their establishments. The OK has an interesting policy on this, will allow loose non bishri so potato chips, well, no, excuse me, will insist on all loose but non bishri so potato chips to be bishri so if they're loose, if they're sold without a package. But we will allow packaged non bishri so potato chips to be served by catered events. The rationale being that if it's a package, a person sees what it is, Person can decide, I like it, I don't like it, what have you. But I just want to point out to you that's something that you can just be aware of. In terms of bitter. I'll, I'll take the question in the end. And then uh, about food to be delivered from a restaurant, obviously the din is just we're not giving a whole shear on chaismas, but if it's the raisa, you need to have two chaismas. If it's the rabbon and one chaismas is enough. If it has kosher tape, 
with the Heksha and the tape is tamper proof, that really has the din of two Chaismas because it's very hard to replicate. So just be mindful that it has to come properly sealed. Discussion a little bit about fish standards. I want to point out to you, again, I'm just sharing with you public information, but something that you may not have access to. And Bezer Hashem, I'm hoping to just make people aware. Different Echshem have different policies with regards to fish. Let me explain. The OK insists that all, our, all the fish we certify, if it does not have skin on, if it has skin on, you have the simon kashos by, by, by looking for fins and scales. But if it's skinless, we require mashkiach to midi to, to, to oversee that fish and seal it. Unless the only exception is with regards to salmon, where we're, we're lenient because we allow the pinkish flesh color to serve as a simon kashras. Most Hasidic Sheikh Shem don't accept this heter, although we did, we were told by very world leading Rabbanim that we can rely on this heter. With regards to herring, some Hasidic Rabbanim even allow herring without skin on because after you take off the skin, there's like a film, like a silver layer. It's kind of like, it almost looks like a film, and you can tell it's herring. On that basis, they'll allow herring without a mashkiach to meet, even if it's skinless, because it's still a reishim. The OK does not, we don't rely on that. Um, the, o, the OU has a lenient policy with regards to fish in general. If the plant is an all-kosher plant, they don't handle any dugum to mayim, they only handle kosher fish, they'll allow such a plant to process fish, skin it, what have you, um, without a mashkiach to meet. You'll have a mashkiach checking at a certain frequency, they deem acceptable, but because it's an all-kosher environment, they'll, they'll make it like that. It's not something that we accept. Uh, the Rechshem also don't accept that the OU knows that, and the OU has their path. I'm just simply mentioning, like for example, tuna fish from Bumblebee or from some other brand, Starkist tuna fish, if it's not OUP for Passover, because for Pesach they have a mashkiach because of Chumr de Pischa, but if it's a year round certified product, they don't have a mashkiach to midi and we, we would not eat that product. And the OU knows that, and they would tell you that if you ask them the question also, they'll tell you there's no mashkiach to midi. Okay, with regards to, I'll take your questions in a couple of minutes, I'm almost done here. Uh, thank you, you've been a patient audience. With regards to butcher shops, sometimes you come to a butcher shop, you ask them for a particular cut of meat from a particular heksher. The reality is you can speak to any shaykhet that not every cut of meat is always available at all times from the same hashkoch, same heksher, the same, uh, same shkita. There are shortages. Sometimes things are not available. So if you go to a butcher and you're looking for, let's say, the baba shkita, you want a certain cut of meat that's not always available. And it's always available it's a little strange, but if they tell you, you know, I, I'm out of this, I, it's not available. It's not a heksha, but it's a simon of erlechkeit. Okay, uh, in the summertime, I just have one more point I want to bring out with regards to meat establishments, just to put things in perspective. The difference in price between kosher retail meat and treif wholesale meat is almost ten tenfold. So for example, um, whatever, let's say meat's gonna cost, kosher will cost $10 a pound. On a wholesale trayful level, that's, uh, you know, butcher can probably get it like a dollar a pound or $1.50 a pound. So chas shalom, if, if a butcher is gonna be un this unscrupulous and be dishonest, the financial incentive is huge. Just to put things in perspective, why you need such tight hashgachah. If a butcher reliably makes, let's say, $250 to $300,000 a year, an honest living, he's working hard, it's kumptim, yeah? But if chas v'shalem, they, they cheat, just for one year, they made $2 million. So the financial gain is so big that you have to have very, very tight hashkacha because you're, you're testing somebody in a way that really can really be, is really inappropriate. Besides the fact that it's a, known, it's a, it's a letter from the Frida Kerebe, the Rabbi uh, of Amar Nabashkin in Tafshin Tess. I believe the date was Ches or Zion of Menachem of. It was during the nine days. I had the letter in my office. Anyway, the Rebbe tells him he was opening some kind of a salami or some kind of meat establishment. And the Rebbe, tell, the Rebbe tells him that's a Kabbalah from Chsidim that even if the meicher, the meicher, the balabas of a place that's uh, serving flesh is a yid, a yishamayim, an erlich yid, he has to have a mashkiach tamidi. That's something that should be mindful of. That's a, a basic, it's an important thing. It, it needs, it needs type pikoda. When shopping at local supermarkets, also be mindful 
of products with Echshedim, just tell you a story that happened to me um, last year. I, I, I traveled quite a bit in the summer. I was upstate and I was in the supermarket late at night, like 10.30 at night, they closed at 11. I was shopping for food for the trip the next day. And the Yitzvah Meretz Yisrael, he just, he just came, to, came to America. He says to me, in Yiddish, uh, you speak Yiddish? I said, yes. He says to me, tell me, what, what can I buy? He's looking for an ice cream because he's going like on a six hour trip. Yeah, it's a good thing his wife didn't know about this. He's going on a six hour trip yeah. And he's gonna, he wants to eat like ice cream to keep himself awake. I understand whatever, you know, you stress. So he's, he's asking me which one is a good hashkocha. So he didn't know I work in kashras. I was, first of all, I was struck by the hashkocha protest that I, I, I went to the, to the store exactly that time. I was planning to go earlier. And anyway, he picks up a product in a, in a Hamish store that was certified dairy equipment. It was a part formula DE with tiny oasis. I, I took on my glass. I said, this is DE, you, we don't eat this. I said, it's, it's a blia cholavakum. So I showed him he could buy from clients, Mahadrin, whatever. He got, he didn't go hungry. But I'm just pointing out that sometimes even a Hamish's store can have products, could be below you, but they don't realize the products that are either past palter, sometimes could be their equipment from Chalavakum, or even Chalavakum itself, or they could be, they be, could be carrying products that we wouldn't accept. Just be aware of that. Vegan restaurants, that's a question I often get asked. Can I, can I go to a vegan restaurant? What's the problem? So vegan restaurants, um, there are certain problems they don't have. It's true, but there are other problems that they do have as well. What are they? For example, Teloim could be a big issue with, with vegan restaurants. Grape-related products is also an issue, and, and Bishalakim is also an issue. So in a vegan restaurant, there are kashras sensitivities happening. So if it doesn't have a reliable hashkacha, you cannot eat there. If it has a reliable hashkacha, very nice. It's true, they don't have to worry about certain things, but there are, there are still some things that have to be taken care of in a, in a vegan restaurant to certify it reliably. Just give you another example about the, the sushi is a popular food. Um, it's very common for sushi chefs to put vinegar inside the rice. Okay. Um, so you have to make sure, of course, of course, that the vinegar is kosher. And of course, the nori needs a good hashkacha because they can be infested. Another thing to be mindful of is some non-dairy products like non-dairy creamers could actually be certified dairy because the company thinks it's non-dairy because they're not deliberately putting in dairy, but halakhically it could still be dairy. Um, now we're going to talk a little bit about Chol Yisrael on the road, and then I'll talk about coffee shops, and then I'll take your questions. So Chol Yisrael on the road, we'll start with that. First of all, full disclosure, I don't drink coffee. I have other food tivas. When I'm, I'm taking long trips and I'm getting tired, I, I go for the Pepsi, but uh, I'm not proud of it. But anyway, but, it, but coffee is a big thing for people that travel. So what do you do? So the question is often asked, can I have a black coffee on the road? Can I have, so, so some, especially when it comes to the people that travel from the city to the mountains, you'll have sometimes a non-Jewish restaurant and the restaurant, you know, the owner wants, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, a, a gas station. He wants to cater to the from Oilam. So he'll have a bottle of Cholvi straw milk there, you know. So if the milk is sealed and you're the first one opening it, you can take as much milk as you like. But if it's not sealed, you cannot drink from that milk because Kvar Lomim has already happened where the same bottle was recycled. non Yisrael milk, first of all, non Yisrael milk is probably half the price and not as it's much more available than the Chol Yisrael milk. You cannot drink open non Yisrael milk in a place that doesn't have a Frumid overseeing it. When it comes to Starbucks with black coffee, rest like, so, so again, I'm going to give you a general Klolim. There's a lot of discussion on this online. Some Echshem have written articles on it. I'm just going to give you general klalim, and I'm going to try to give you, I would say, a few different uh, scenarios, some of which are better than others. Black coffee coming from a, a large urn that's like built into the wall is the best, because if it's built into the wall, they're really cleaning it in place. You don't have to worry about them washing that keli together with other kalim that are not kosher, and you don't have to come out to the heter of soap and, and pegima. If you have, and that's perfect, that's allowed. Um, black coffee that's coming from just a coffee shop and they don't, it's not a restaurant, it's also better because not such a big, not too many big shy lists are gonna happen there. But if it's a restaurant, if it's a Starbucks that has a full-fledged restaurant, they serve sandwiches. So then the Kalem all being washed together and there's mama's trays there. It's very, it's sketchy. And the issue is, uh, you know, you're making sure that the soap is going in before the hot water, you know. It's not so push it. So it's, if, it's, if it's a Starbucks that only has black coffee and no 
town, which is, I don't even know if it exists. I don't know if it exists before today. It used to exist that way. It's one thing, but if it's a full-fledged restaurant, it's better to go, let's say, to a place that just serves coffee, a real coffee shop, not, a, not an actual restaurant. Not even getting to the Mar Marasain issue, which is a, another discussion um, when it comes to getting, and then also be mindful, you can't use the frothing pipe because that frothing pipe is used for hot hole of akum going through. You could pour soy, if it's a soy milk, if it's parv, some soy milk or dairy equipment, also be careful if it's parv, you could use that. And that you could use if it's an open bottle because there's no, no real hanob chalip in there. I wouldn't have a problem with that. Um, I want to be messiah with one more point and then I'll take your questions. Bechlal, when it comes to inyonim of, of ruchnius and, and kashras, particularly that's our subject at hand, our job is to just put in a ishtadlus, to, to make an effort to do things in a mahodadik way. And of course, there's no way for a human being to, to know everything or to know every scenario. That's not what the Ebishter wants from us. The Ebishter wants us to put in our ishtadlus in an edele erlicha way. And then the Ebishter is going to give us a siyata dishmaya that we're going to find out and we're going to be zohir and be careful and be protected in areas that we need to be protected. Okay, I'll take your questions, but again, um, anyone have any questions? Yes. Potato chip. So yeah, when you say the not is like not officially is not filtered, anything else I have a citizen has to use it's considered not officially is not filtered. The okay, when we certify potato chips, we require them to be Bishal Yisrael for certifying it, unless it's being cooked with, with steam. But if it's cooked like with actual uh, fire and, and the like, um, or boiling water, we would make it Bishal Yisrael. Um, the OU, the potato chips are not Bishal Yisrael. They hold it doesn't have to be Bishal Yisrael because it's served as a snack food. And that's the heter. But if you want to be mach by going after the Minha Michael, the Minha Michael is a potato and a potato is Choshev depending how it's prepared. So according to the Minha Michael, it would be Choshev, yeah. I'm sorry? The Pringles? So Pringles are made differently. They are made from dehydrated potatoes, you're correct. And that's why they all look the same way, because they're, they're, they're shaped and, and formed. Um, that's why the brachas are shahakal also. Um, in some ways, a Pringle is easier than a potato chips because it's, it gets reformed and, and remade into something new. So it's panam chadash, it's like a new entity. And the bracha changes, so you can say, it's harder to say, you're going after the minha meichel, because it's not really connected to the original source, it's created into a new thing. And some people are more lenient with regards to Pringles for that reason. I actually heard from Rabbi Hendel, the Rav of Montreal, Lava Shalom, his Eneklach told me, we have one here, that, uh, that he allowed the, um, that Yezeda allowed people to, that's Yezeda? Yuz I'm sorry. Okay, sorry. But anyway, he allowed his Eneklach to have Pringles because of this reason, but not potato chips. So. And you, again, people have different approaches on this matter. I'm just sharing with you information, which you may find helpful. What's with the corn chips? So corn yeah. chips, corn is a good question. Corn chips are even easier because in America, corn um, is probably the cheapest feedstock. So corn syrup and whatever you make from corn. And it's really considered a Michael Ziburis. It's considered to be a, a very, very cheap food in America. So in America, it's not choshev. And even as a min, you don't really see corn being served at weddings. Some, maybe a corn salad. It depends on the country. In Eretz Yisrael, for sure, it's served. In America, some Rabbanim Amachmer, the National Shadim take a lenient approach with regards to corn for that reason. Um, and, uh, but in places like, for example, a, a corn taco or something like that, in places like Mexico, it could be Choshev. But in America, it's not considered too Choshev. So there are people that are Machmer, ambitious Yisrael, on, on corn chips. But I'm saying that's an even bigger chumrah than something like a potato chip, because the, the old min itself of corn, lav dafka, is considered choshev. And, and it's also shtikel nechel kamayshu chai, a shtikel, not, not exactly, but yeah. What about cereals? Cheerios. So Cheerios and, and breakfast cereals, um, I have a podcast on that, Akash was being in the know, but basically most of them are manufactured in a non-conventional way, which means to say they're not going through a, a, a regular baking process. They're either extruded, they're puffed, some of them are steamed. And these are non-classical ways of manufacturing. They didn't have the times of Chazal, they didn't ask for it, they mamru be mamru, and we're not making new gazetas. So uh, most Rabbanim hold, they don't have to be past and bishul Yisrael for that reason. There are those that are machmer, I'm, I'm absolutely the machmer, but uh, 
Lalocha, you have solid ground to be makol. The only one, the only cereal that I've come across that I would say it's Kedai Snochen Lahachmer for Pas Yisrael is post grape nut cereal, which is baked as a bar. So it has Surah Dinam, has like a Surah to it, and then later it gets ground up later. The post grape nut, as far as I know, that cereal is baked as a bar and then broken later. So it's baked as a bar. It has, at the time of the baking, it has like the Surah of, of Pas if it's baking. But if it doesn't have it, um, you have a lot of to do them to be make a lot. There's also truth in the, in the Taras Mayim about it. You mentioned earlier about the Yavid, you know, the country's at bliss, either in a place, in an environment, <coughs> going in town, out of town, at a local standard. So if somebody's traveling from in town, he's going to out of town place, someone goes, he's in Australia, he's in England, what's together? So I'll answer your question. It's a great question. Thank you for bringing it up. If you let's say someone is uh, has family in, in Australia or out of town, and there they do use lists. If you're there, yeah, that's what you do because that's what you could do. But when you come here, you you got to do what's available here. A, a younger man came over to me. He married someone from over, overseas, and he says over there they rely on lists, and that, well, that's what they have. He wants. So he says that particular cereal is on a list. He wants to know if the same, that cereal could be bought in America. That actually, I said, the first of all, it's probably not the same factory. I said, second of all, no, you know, you live over here, you have stuff with the good you're not in that matzah. So it really depends on the matzah. Right? Well, how do you apply it? If you're in a matzah situation where you don't have no choices, so then you're allowed to, but if you have other choices, it's not appropriate. Burger has a lot of fish recipes. Burger has a has lamb, fat, or something different. Give me So you have to ask the heksher or ask the mashkiach that. Consumers have a right to for, to find information, and and the goal of tonight is to empower consumers. I don't know. I don't know. You can ask the extra. Like right. Is that a is that like more of a happy thing? Is it the so I'll tell you, most national shadim they, they make pasty straw products. I actually have a, I've got a, a bagel company, a huge bagel company. They supply half the United States. Uh, I don't know about half, but a lot. Um, and there, their, their bagels are pasty straw. I had this close to do it. So there they have a burning pilot in the oven. It stays on all the time, plus a, a heating element, um, which almost all national shadim allow. It's really like a kissim throwing in, and it's on all the time. And according to Allah, even if you have a little bit of fire, it's um, a Yad Yisrael, and it's, uh, that's enough to make it past Yisrael. The OU happens to be Machmer based on a, a Belsky, Allah Shalom. He held that he didn't like the whole thing of, of, of pilots or, or actually a pilot that could be a big flame. I think he was Matir, but he didn't like the whole idea of a heating element because if you couldn't actually bake with the heating element itself, he didn't like it. Akapon and most rabbonim that I've spoken to allow it. And be be besides the fact that it's being made in the base of Kharaj, in a factory, which is other tzadadim lahakil, so it's certainly allowed. Well, now, if you're going to ask me, is it as mahudr as a pasi stroll that the yid lit that fire for that time? Okay, you could tie it's a little bit more mahudr, but it's certainly acceptable to eat that pasi stroll in, in that oifin. It's not supposed to be They have no like, it's a have it in the market. They have like a different place. Yeah. You mean they have an actual have store? So, so, you, so as a consumer, ask a question. Say, do you serve sandwiches? Do you just serve coffee? Find out. If it's just coffee, it's easier. Then you're usually just dealing with Yisrum de Rabbanan, like the milk. Yeah. It's you know if if it's if the hot if the hot water urn or the coffee urn is built into the wall, it's the most mahodika setup. But if they're not serving food, if it's just it's pretty good because how do they clean? Do they clean the host, do they clean the host? You ask them how they clean it. You can ask them, you can say to them that you're allergic to dairy, you want to just know how it's clean. Ask them some questions. Um, I mean it's it's definitely I would give it I'd give it a medium I'd give it a medium grade, a medium grade. It's better than the ones with the, you know, the, uh, with the restaurants and probably not as good as built in, but it's, it's acceptable. If you could just find out how they clean it or whatever, ask a few oh, questions. By the way, before I answer the next question, cold brew coffee is a question I get a lot. does require hashkacha because it is pasteurized. 
Cold brew refers to the actual steeping process. Okay, it's a cold coffee, but it's pasteurized. It can be pasteurized on kalim that, that had iser, whatever. So it needs ashkacha. It's Americano. It's Americano. It's that coffee that you put in the fresh coffee, they pour in water. They have an option there stuff. I used to be very. I'm sorry. I'm not, I plead the fifth. I don't know. I've no. So that's also a question, right? So, so you know, I do take hot water from a hotel. Actually, I have a podcast on that. Also, um, we just we just launched, we just played it last week, this past, a few days ago. If you if you're getting hot water, the hotels I go to often, I go to the Hilton chain. They have one urn for hot water, one for black coffee, one for flavored coffee. It's dedicated, okay. And then in the kitchen itself, they have a, a machine that's built into the wall just for hot water. It's pretty kosher safe. The only the only concern potentially could be if you have hot water, so maybe or black coffee, maybe someone put in cholavakum in their cup, and then you have worried about nitzuk chibur. But even then, a lot of times they're not pouring a continuous pour. It's usually spurts, and anybody ever we're not worried. You, it's kosher to drink. What do you mean? No, that's what I'm saying. But the you don't have to worry about it. But uh, you know, if you're traveling, it's it's allowed. So coffee and lemon plain is also a similar kind of question. They're going to wash the, right, they're washing that, that uh, decanter or that, that, uh, that urn, um, usually in the hangar with a lot of other kalim. But basically they're, 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 they're being same on the, 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 on the beginning of the, the soap, they're washing with the soap. Um, it's mutter to drink. It's not, uh, it's not the most mahudu thing, but it's mutter to drink. Europe, Australia, Brazil, where I live, a lot of people that are sick on a list Right. Yes, yeah, so I'm saying in a li list, if you're in a place where you have limited cash opportunities, it's a different story. A lot of what? Yeah, so I, I, I have a podcast about that, and it's something you have to be careful about. And it's that's definitely an area where chosset should be a little bit more discerning. I'll give you an example. There's a particular drink that a Heksha recommends. They don't certify. They visit there once a year. If, if we were certifying that drink, we would visit the factory once a month, 12 times more, with a contract, with data. With a, so this is a very shvach. Uh, so I'm not saying all this are like that, but I'm saying the potential of having an issue like that on the list is much more accentuated. I'll tell you another story. Um, there are some shame even in America, and I, I'm against, against this, and I'm, I'm not going to mention any names, but they'll, 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 they'll advertise, say that, okay, applesauce without hashkacha, is acceptable because most of the time they're, they're running it on dedicated equipment just for applesauce. That's true, but it's not all the time. I, 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 I was giving a hechshu in a factory, one area of a factory, that, that other factory was, they are producing applesauce for other customers, but in commercial applesauce, and it was done on kettles that serving tray, they were cooking tray just a few minutes before, it was clean up, same steam, mamish a sister, and really not kosher. So again, if a person's in a place where they have very little opportunity, they do some checking, you know, you have, you have also more shmita there because you're not know, matzav dochah. But it's not something that we should be doing over here. What do you say about hard cheese? The Yad Yehuda holds that if you take a hard cheese and you mix it into a tafshil, into another dish, and you, you bake it, the kharifas goes away. But we don't really, I, don't, I haven't seen chassidim rely on it. Other people rely on it. Taka. Yeah. Soy makam. That's because of Kalim, because of Kalim. We cannot have it. Yeah. Yeah, Blea sister, yeah. Because the company's not putting any dairy in it, but it's still running, it's still running hot on dairy equipment. It's a problem for us. Where I live, it's very common that the, you know, always need to make money, I guess. Take a non-kosher restaurant, cash. So many people there are claiming that it's not shy at such a small amount of time. Cash Place. Your experience. How much time are they doing it in? 30 minutes. Oh. Um, I don't know. <laughs> uh, oh, you mean just a temporary? First of all, Bechlal is a Kabbalah. I mean, this is from my wife, Zayda, Rabbi Berlivi, at least I have from him. My Shaver Lavashalom told this to me also that he didn't hold of koshering complicated establishments back at, like, you know, you can kosher once, but it's a real job. So you're raising an issue. It, it does not sound good to me. I don't know Pratim, but 
it's kashering a restaurant is a very, very difficult job, and a lot of things you cannot kasher also, some things you have to put aside. So, uh, okay, that's a whole nother discussion. You have to bring me back at the end of the summer for that one. But anyway. <laughs> Five more minutes. Okay, okay, okay. I'll, I'll talk about it. So, with regards to hotels, Bechlal, first of all, okay, Bechlal going to a hotel is, 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 there's a lot of, there's a lot of different levels. If it's a kosher hotel with a kosher kitchen from Valabas, it's, it's Avad, it's Kishmak, it's beautiful. There are such hotels that exist. If you have a hotel that does not have a kosher kitchen, they're kosher in the kitchen, so they're going to guaranteed use some coolness that they don't have to use when you have a dedicated kosher kitchen. And then if you're talking about Pesach, you're adding a whole nother level of sensitivity. I don't have to all tell you all, well, well, whether or not the Mishtich, but we eat out. But, but I just want to point out to you that the most complicated elements of giving a shadim refer to food service. And in food service gulfa, it's in a it's in a hotel setting because in a, in a restaurant it's always kosher. You you kosher it's, it's kosher all the time. A hotel you're making a kosher and there's multiple events. The, more, the dynamics are much more complex. <clears throat> now I don't mean the most complicated in terms of technically, but the kosher sensitivity wise, it's very 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 uh, sensitive. So if a person's gonna if a person has the custom to or if you know someone who goes out to Pesach hotels, people sometimes ask me. I tell them which hotels have a a proper standard for those that, are, that, that eat out. Some people, you know, of course, we, it's better not to, to eat at home, whatever. But even then, to eat in a hotel, it has to be done right. It's very, very involved. And there's two things I want to say to really answer this point. There's kashra standards, and then there's enforcement. So you have some achshedim that have lower standards than what I want, but they enforce whatever they say. Then you have achshedim that have higher standards, but they don't always enforce those standards. That's a problem of enforcement. The good achshedim have high standards and enforce. So again, this all requires a certain amount of basic information, you know, you want to find out if you're a chassid, we, we, you know, if we want to do things in, in the best way possible. Find a little information out. In terms of basket, it's complicated. It's complicated, yeah. We can talk after my diff. <laughs> okay, it's, thank you. I'm thank you very much. Fish, 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 fish. Mm-hmm. It's like a side of sand. It's <laughs> Um, my mouth. 